Good morning, and welcome to Faith United Methodist Church. My name is Dorothy Wurzbauer, and I'm one of the Faith Lay Worship Leaders. Let's begin by reciting our church's mission statement together. Faith United Methodist Church is a church family dedicated to bringing people to Jesus Christ through worship, education, mission, and fellowship. The world is full of troubles, war, famine, hurricanes, hunger, and homelessness. At times, the bad news is overwhelming. At times, there appears to be no hope. Today, we start this season of Advent, the season of four weekends before Christmas. On this first weekend of Advent, let us turn to Christ, who is the hope of the world. Our first reading is from Malachi chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. See, I am sending my messenger to prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, indeed he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming, and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like washer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the descendants of Levi, and refine them like gold and silver, until they present offerings to the Lord in righteousness. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord, as in the days of old, and as in former years. Our second reading is from Luke, chapter 1, verses 5 through 13. In the days of Herod of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah, who belonged to the priestly order of Abijah. His wife was a descended from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Both of them were righteous before God living blamelessly according to all the commandments and regulations of the Lord. But they had no children because Elizabeth was barren and both were getting on in years. Once when he was serving as priest before God during his section's turn of duty, he was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood to enter the sanctuary of the Lord to offer incense. Now at the time of the incense offering, the whole assembly of the people was praying outside. Then there appeared to him an angel of the Lord, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was terrified, and fear overwhelmed him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will name him John. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. church. It's good to see you today. My name is Caleb Hong. Thank you so much for joining us here in the sanctuary on this rainy Sunday and also those of you who chickened out and joined us online. <laughs> Thank you for worshiping with us. I thought about uh, worshiping online too. Uh, with today we begin our uh, season of Advent and uh, as you've heard throughout this service, Advent is the season of four weeks, uh, four Sundays and the days in between where we prepare to welcome Christ. And um, this is not only at his birth 2,000 years ago, 
but also at his second coming, at a time unknown, when he will usher in a new era of peace and hope. So in the upcoming weeks, we will consider the various themes of Advent, but in addition, we're going to learn something more about a, a, a specific biblical figure whose life and ministry is very closely intertwined with Advent's themes, and that is John the Baptist. John the Baptist, more than anyone else in Scripture, his life, his mission, it aligns very, very closely with the themes of Advent. So as we consider John's life, his ministry, may we prepare to receive Christ into our hearts. Let's pray, and we'll begin. Lord, you're so gracious. So thank you for the rains that water the earth. Thank you for the waters that refresh our souls. And thank you for your spirit that gives us peace. So would you meet us again this day? Would you open our eyes to see, open our ears to hear, and soften our hearts to receive the gift of your word? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I want to begin by just offering a brief history lesson about Advent and how it came to be. So uh, some of you know this already. In the ancient world, whenever a monarch or a ruler wanted to go see the kingdom, um, they they never left uh, unannounced. They never just kind of meandered into their kingdom. They always sent an official herald or messenger ahead of them to announce their coming. Now these royal visits, they were a big deal because it wasn't every day that monarchs would leave their throne and just go visit and rub shoulders with the locals. So when the announcement was heard, it was usually received in this way. There was a flurry of activity. There was the cleaning of streets, fixing of roads, bridges, gates, and of course, preparations for a great feast. And people even uh, went out of their way to wash and take a bath and uh, put on their best clothes because everyone wanted to look and smell their best for the king. Advent, the word, comes from the Latin word adventus, and that word means arrival or coming. Now, up until the 4th century A.D., there really was no official date for Christmas. Uh, As Christians, we knew um, the date, the specific date of Jesus' death and resurrection, but we had never set, and the Bible doesn't say the exact day of uh, his birth. So uh, church leaders, early church leaders gathered together, and they debated, and they established December 25th as the day to celebrate Jesus' birthday. Of course, the question you may ask is, why December 25th? And the answer is because in the ancient calendars, this was the day of the winter solstice. The winter solstice marks the shortest day of the year, the darkest day of the year, when there's the shortest amount of daylight. And then since Jesus is the light of the world, the early Christians planned it this way, so that after his birth, the world would become brighter and the days would become longer. Of course, soon after the early uh, church leaders set this day, the the 25th of December, they also uh, settled on a season that would lead up to the celebration of Christmas. So they established the four Sundays before Christmas, and again, the weekdays in between, to be the days of preparation for Jesus' arrival. And that's how we have Advent. So let's be clear. Advent is not a religious term for the Christmas shopping season. That's not the same thing. And preparing for Christmas is, does not consist of shopping till you drop. That's also uh, uh, not, not true. For Christians, Advent is a time for prayer and preparation. It's a time for inner cleaning and soul decluttering and making space to receive Christ our Lord. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the ministry of John the Baptist, his life and mission is intricately tied in with the themes of Advent. So I want to spend a few minutes then reminding us about who John is. So in the third chapter of Malachi, Malachi is the very last book of the Old Testament, um, we hear these words that Rebecca read for us. See, I am sending my messenger to prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Indeed, he is coming, says the Lord. 
So the book of Malachi was written around 400 B.C. Uh, at, and at the end of Malachi's book is this promise that God will send the Messiah, the one we've been waiting for, the, the one whom we'll delight in. But before God sends the Messiah, God will first send a messenger, a herald who will announce his coming to prepare the way of the Lord. And then in the very next chapter of Malachi, this is the last chapter of Malachi, which is also the final chapter of the Old Testament, we hear these words from Malachi chapter 4. See, I will send you the prophet Elijah before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of parents to their children and the hearts of children to their parents so that I will not come and strike the land with the curse. And it's with these words that the Old Testament ends. And with this promise, the Old Testament leaves us waiting. Now, those of you with Jewish friends know that the Jewish people are still waiting for Elijah's return. Who's Elijah? Elijah, uh, he did ministry about 450 years before Malachi. Elijah was the prophet who never died. He ascended into heaven on a chariot of fire. Malachi promises that God would send Elijah as the official herald, the message, to prepare the way for the Messiah's arrival. Now, for Christians... These verses at the end of the Old Testament, they become the segue into the New Testament. And this is why each of the four gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, this is why they start with a reference to John the Baptist. So when you read Gospel of Matthew, you first start off with a story about Jesus' birth. What do we read right after the stories of Jesus' birth? We read about John the Baptist. Uh, the Gospel of Mark opens up immediately with the ministry of John the Baptist, even before mentioning Jesus. And the same is true for Luke, <laughs> even before Jesus is mentioned. Luke goes right into the birth story of John the Baptist and then goes into Jesus' birth story. And then as for the Gospel of John, John is clear that before we can fully understand the identity of Jesus, he wants us to know and hear about the ministry of John the Baptist who came to prepare the way. Jesus and the gospel writers were clear. John the Baptist is the long-awaited Elijah sent by God to prepare the world and to prepare our hearts for the Lord. Today's gospel reading, again, which Rebecca read for us, it comes from Luke chapter 1, and this is the announcement of John's birth. The story goes like this. John's parents, they're an elderly couple, Zechariah and Elizabeth. They live in a village we believe to be Ein Kerem, about four miles west of the temple in Jerusalem. Zechariah was a priest from the line of Abijah. Elizabeth was a descendant of Aaron, which makes her a PK, a priest's kid. Luke establishes right away that they were a righteous couple. They lived righteously according to God, blamelessly according to the commandments and regulations of the Lord. Now, this is a significant detail because the very next detail, the very next fact that we learn about this couple is they had no children. Elizabeth was barren. She was unable to bear children. And in ancient times, in these times when Elizabeth and Zechariah were living, childlessness, it was seen as a curse as a sign of God's displeasure, as a sign of God's punishment for sin. But again, we're told Zechariah and Elizabeth were righteous. There was no reason for God's displeasure. There was no sin that demanded retribution. So how are we to understand their childlessness? We'll come to that a little bit later. Well, one day, Zechariah is serving in the temple with his uh, group, He's taking his turn to care for the sacrifices when he's chosen by lot. To be chosen by lot is like drawing straws in the time of ancient Israelites. And he's chosen by lot to enter into the sanctuary of the Lord and offer incense. I don't know if y'all knew this. Not many priests entered physically into the inner sanctuary of the temple. Um, you know, we enter the sanctuary all the time as Protestants. Not so much in, uh, in, in Zechariah's day. So we know that back from King David's day, the priesthood was divided into 24 divisions. 
all 24 divisions, they gather together to celebrate the high holy days like Passover when the temple would be, you know, overflowing with people. But outside of these high holy days, each of the 24 divisions, they were only assigned to serve in the temple for two weeks out of the year. So priests, when they come in, even when they came in, they would serve outside in the courts of the temple. Not many people went into the temple itself. So this, you know, this honor of going into the temple itself to offer incense, it was a big deal. It was like the highlight of Zechariah's priestly ministry. So Zechariah, he's honored, he's blessed, and when it comes time to offer the incense, he steps into the inner temple, into the sanctuary alone. But once he's inside, he realizes he's not alone after all. There's another figure inside there, and we're told by Luke that it was an angel, the angel Gabriel. Zechariah, when he realizes Gabriel, Gabriel is present, he responds appropriately with utter fear and terror. Again, he was excited, he was honored, he felt blessed to enter into the temple, and now he's shaking in his boots and he's terrified for his life. The angel Gabriel recognizes this in Zechariah, and he says to him, verse 13, Luke chapter 1, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. What prayer? He just stepped into the sanctuary. The second part of verse 13. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will name him John. Verses 16 and 17. He will turn many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God, and with the spirit and the power of Elijah, he will go before him to turn the hearts of parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make people ready, uh, to make ready a people <coughs> prepared for the Lord. I hope these words sound familiar, because these are uh, direct references to what we just read in the book of Malachi. So the angel tells Zechariah that his wife Elizabeth was going to bear a child in her old age and that this miracle child would be the messenger that uh, Malachi had foretold, which meant the uh, Messiah was coming and their son, John, was going to be Elijah, preparing the people for his arrival. Now, that's the story. And for the rest of this message, then, I just want to unpack a little this encounter between Zechariah and Gabriel, because I think this encounter offers us insights into how God operates in our world and also into how we can prepare ourselves for Christ this Christmas. So I'm going to offer three, uh, three reflections. First reflection is this. God hears our prayers and answers in God's time, God always hears our prayers, and God will answer in God's time. Here's the good news and bad news about prayer. The good news is this. Again, God always hears our prayers. The bad news is this. God does not always give us what we want when we want it. God always hears our prayers, even when it seems like God doesn't. But God doesn't give us exactly what we want when we want it. God is not a genie. So when we pray... A helpful way to think about prayer when we're offering our request to God is this. God will answer in one of three ways. With a yes, with a no, or with a not yet. Yes, no, or not yet. The preacher, Norman Vincent Peale, he put it this way. God answers prayers in three ways. There's the yes, there's the no, and then there's, there's wait a while. <laughs> Let's wait a little bit. So when God answers yes to our prayers, this is reason for praise and celebration. When the family member gets healed, when broken relationships are mended, when God makes a way where there once was no way. However, there are also those times when God responds to our prayers with a no. Loved ones get sick and pass away. Children struggle Marriages crumble. Businesses go bankrupt. All of us have experienced those pains and heartaches in life when God's answer to our prayer was a no. So again, going back to Zechariah and Elizabeth, 
when they were younger, Elizabeth and Zechariah, they prayed earnestly for a baby. This was their deepest desire. This was a part of their everyday prayers. And for years, they wrestled with the fact, the personal pain, the social stigma that they had no child. And they wondered again for years what they did wrong, why they were being punished. As they got older, once Elizabeth was past childbearing age, I imagine they stopped praying this prayer. The old wounds in this area of their heart had scabbed over. They had accepted the fact that they were not going to be biological parents. And I think this is why Zechariah was shocked to hear Gabriel's announcement. First, he was terrified by Gabriel's presence, but then he's shocked to hear Gabriel's words. This is also why Zechariah's response to Gabriel's announcement was doubt and disbelief. As it turns out, God's response to Elizabeth and Zechariah's prayer from years ago, from decades ago, it was never a no. It was simply wait a while, a not yet. As Gabriel reminds Zechariah, God heard their prayers. Even when God was silent, even when God seemed distant, even when Elizabeth's childbearing age came and went, God heard their prayers and God answered in God's time. Friends, I know there's times when we pray and we wonder why God doesn't answer right away. The good news is this. God's time is always the best time. Amen? Let me say that again. God's time is always the best time. Amen? So here's the first point for us. God hears our prayer always. And God answers in God's time. Second point for us today is this. God knows our pain And God uses our hurts to offer hope to others. So over the years, I have prayed with a number of couples who've struggled with infertility, like Zechariah and like Elizabeth. After praying with them, there have been some that miraculously conceived and had children, but this is the exception to the rule. There are a number of couples with whom I prayed who never had children of their own. But whenever I meet with couples who ask for this kind of specific prayer, I always assure them that their childlessness is not a curse from God. And neither is it a punishment for their sin or other sins. I point out biblical examples of couples who wrestled with infertility. That includes Zechariah, Elizabeth. It includes Abraham and Sarah. It includes Jacob and Rachel. Their inability to have children is not a curse from God. It's not a sign of God's displeasure and punishment. And finally, I assure them that God hears their prayers and God knows their pain, that God loves them deeply, whether they ever have children or not, and God can take their hurts and use it for hope and healing for others. Perhaps it's to offer comfort for others who are wrestling with issues of infertility. Perhaps it's to care for children in other ways. Recently, I heard the story of a couple in Kansas City. Their names are Brandon and Lacey Holly. Uh, Brandon and Lacey, they struggled with infertility for the first seven years of their marriage. In these seven years, they had four miscarriages. Eventually, they had two um, successful pregnancies, and they gave birth to their own two children, but then the doctor said no more, and yet Lacey felt there's more children that God was putting on her heart to care for. During their struggle to start a family, God was placing, and God had placed a burden for foster children, for children who did not have a family of their own. Now, the Hollies, they never met a foster child before. They never met a foster parent before. They didn't know what to do, but after prayer and after several signs that pointed them in this direction, they said yes, they went through training, and they became, in 2017, foster parents for infants ages eight months to three years old. Over the last five years, since 2017, the Hollies have provided a home for 30 babies, 30 babies who found a loving home with a loving family in the Hollies until they could find a more permanent home or another foster uh, set of foster parents. Now, this burden for foster children, it was birthed in the time of pain and uh, struggle for the Hollies 
Uh, even when it felt like God wasn't hearing them, even when it felt like they were struggling, the bottom line was this. God was hearing their prayers. God always hears our prayers. And if we offer our hurts to God, God can use our hurts to offer hope and healing to others. Last point for today is this. God calls the righteous and age is not an issue. God calls the righteous and age is not an issue. Ministry has no retirement age. As long as we wake up on this side of planet Earth, God has work for us to do. Now this uh, last point has to do with that detail that Luke gives us about Elizabeth and Zechariah. I love that detail. You know, Luke doesn't have to say a ton, but he gives us a couple of facts. And one of the things that Luke says about Elizabeth and Zechariah is that they were advanced in years. Now, other translations, they simply say Elizabeth and Zechariah were very old. They just say it very bluntly. Now, this is not meant to be insulting, This is meant to be revealing of how God works. Because biblically speaking, God regularly calls seasoned adults to do God's greatest work. Amen? Yeah, it's true. Take a look at this. Uh, Abraham and Sarah, how old were they when God called them to leave uh, their home and go to the promised land? Abraham was 75 years old. Sarah was 65 years old. How old were Abraham and Sarah when they had their first and only child? Abraham was 100, and Sarah was 90. Another example, how old was Moses when God called Moses from the burning bush to lead the his, uh, Hebrews out of, e, uh, out of Egypt? How old was Moses? 80 years old, 80 years old. <laughs> Here's my point. The Bible doesn't follow the guidelines of the U.S. federal government when it comes to retirement age. I met with my mother over Thanksgiving, and uh, we were just talking about this and that, and uh, she just reminded me very bluntly that retirement from ministry does not happen at age 65. (laughs) She said, biblically speaking, retirement happens when we die, right? Until then, God wants us to stay prayerful and faithful because God is not done with us yet. Can I get a praise God for faithful mothers? (laughs) Praise God for faithful mothers. Please turn to your neighbor and say these words to a neighbor. Say, God is not done with you yet. Turn to another neighbor and say, God is not done with you yet. You know, every year I serve with our nominations committee and we're looking for people who we can place in leadership positions. And can I tell you, I love to hear when people are retiring. I love to hear it because we're going to go to them right away. Because when people get older, here's the reality. At the age of 60, 62, 65, even 70, what do people have? They have wisdom, maturity, they have faith. They have life experience, and now when they're retiring, they have time. They have time, amen, to be unleashed for God's work. Here at Faith, let me tell you, many of the strongest ministries in our church were started by retirees. You know this to be true. Many of our strongest church members and leaders and volunteers are the more mature and seasoned veterans of life. God calls us to ministry, and age is not an issue. That's good news for some of you. Bad news for some of you, too. I want to close with this story. It's the story of a missionary named Evelyn Brand. Evelyn Brand was born in England in the the late 1800s, and when she was a young woman, she felt God calling her to go as a missionary to India to share the gospel with the poorest of the poor. So she went, and every day... Every night, at the start of the day, at the end of each night, her prayer was this. Here I am, Lord, and use me, Lord. Here I am, Lord. Use me, Lord. While in the mission field, Evelyn met, and she married a young man named Jesse. And for their first seven years in India, Evelyn writes, there wasn't a single convert. There was a lot of work, but at least on the outside, there was no fruit. However, on that seventh year, a local tribal leader got sick, And he was dying from an unknown disease, and only Evelyn and Jesse stayed with him and cared for him. 
Before he died on his deathbed, this tribal leader declared that their God was the one and true God, and he entrusted his children to Evelyn and to Jesse. Well, Evelyn and Jesse stayed in India for another 13 years. And for these next 13 years, ministry thrived. Countless people came to Christ. But then, suddenly, Jesse became sick and he died. At the time, Elizabeth was 50 years old. Everyone in Elizabeth's family, including her children, who were now living in the United States, they felt like it was time for uh, Evelyn to retire and come home. But Evelyn didn't feel this way, so she didn't. She stayed in the mission field for another 20 years. She became known by the locals as Granny Brand. When Granny Brand turned 70 years old, she was informed by her denomination's mission board that they would no longer support her because she was getting too old. They were going to cut off her funding. So they threw a big retirement party and everyone expected Evelyn to return home to where her son was in Minnesota. At that retirement party, Evelyn shared a secret with family and friends. And the secret was... She wasn't going to the United States. She wasn't going anywhere. For the past several decades, Evelyn had been saving money to build a shack on the side of the mountain. So when the mission board cut off her funding, she moved into her shack and she bought a donkey and she started ministry at a whole new location. Even in her 70s, she was traveling around the mountains of rural India on her donkey sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. When she was 75 years old, Evelyn fell and she broke her hip. Her son, who was a surgeon in Minnesota, came to see her. He cared for her and he said to her, Mom, it was a great run, but I think it's time to stop. Come home. Let me care for you. Evelyn refused. She felt God was calling her to stay in India. So she recovered from her fall and she continued her ministry because there was no fall, no concussion, no bumps, no bruises, no age that was going to stop her. And her daily prayer every day and every night was the same. Here I am, Lord. Use me, Lord. Finally, When Evelyn was 93 years old, she couldn't ride around the mountain on her donkey anymore. Her body and her bones were becoming weaker and frail. While the people in the villages on this mountain had grown to love Evelyn so much that they took turns carrying her, literally, from village to village so she can continue her ministry. They loved her so much they carried her so she can continue the ministry of sharing the love of Jesus Christ, which she did for two more years until she passed away at the age of 95. Only then did she return home. And friends, home was not in England and it was not in Minnesota. Home was not in the United States and it was not even in India. Where was home? For Evelyn, it was very clear. It's with Jesus who loved her who she walked with and talked with, who she rode on that donkey with on the sides of India for 70 years. During this season of Advent, I invite us to prepare the way for the Lord. Let's hear the message of John the Baptist. Let's make prayer and worship a priority. Let's make it a priority to clear the chaos and the clutter from our hearts so that every day and every night, We can pray the prayer of Granny Brand. Here I am, Lord. Use me, Lord. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord, for the gift of your word. We thank you for your promises. Lord, that you always hear our prayers. You're at work in ways that we cannot even imagine. Even when we are hurting, even when life is going in in a very difficult direction, you never leave us nor forsake us. You promise, Lord, even to use our hurts to offer hope and healing to others. So, Lord, as we start this season of Advent, our minds may be racing in a hundred different directions, but would you help us to hear the still, small voice of your Holy Spirit inviting us to prepare the way for the Lord. 
to prepare our hearts to receive Christ, to soften our hearts to worship and to love God and to love our neighbors. Thank you for this time together. Thank you for your holy word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you would turn to your neighbor and say, God loves you and so do I. God loves you and so do I. You know, the, uh, in our society, uh, people have been gearing up for the shopping season for, since October, <laughs> very early. And sometimes that can overwhelm the season of Advent. And for Christians, I would invite us, remember the words of Christ, prepare the way for the Lord in your hearts, in your life. Share God's love. In the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit, Amen.